The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled On the Cusp of a New Era in Treatment of Eosinophilic Esophagitis, Expert Insights on the Latest Advances in Targeted Therapy. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash A-Z-H 860. Downloadable slides are also available. Welcome to this educational program on the cusp of a new era in the treatment for eosinophilic esophagitis, insights on the latest, latest advances on targeted therapy. My name is Iko Hirano, professor of medicine in the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology in the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. Let's start off with the epidemiology of EOE. The prevalence of EOE has been estimated at about one case per 2,000 people in Western countries, with an incidence that's been estimated at 10 cases per 100,000 individuals annually. EOE occurs mostly in patients between the ages of 25 and 50, and is three times more common in men than women. It is found in up to 23% of patients undergoing upper endoscopy for an indication of dysphagia. Today, EOE has now been recognized as the most common cause of food bolus impaction. There is importance to making an early diagnosis of eosinophilic esophagitis. When uncontrolled or undiagnosed, EOE can lead to esophageal strictures. In fact, strictures can be identified in 39% of EOE patients with more than five years of diagnostic delay. And these are strictures defined by inability to pass a standard adult upper endoscope. Feeding dysfunction has also been reported and is especially relevant for children, where between 14 and 60% of patients with EOE develop feeding dysfunction. 21% of children with EOE who have had feeding disorders also have failure to thrive. For both adults and children, EOE can lead to a negative impact on quality of life. ATP has been clearly recognized as a risk factor for eosinophilic esophagitis. When looking across these pediatric and adult studies and looking at the prevalence of ATP in the general population, you can see a marked increase in atopic disease across a spectrum of type 2 inflammatory diseases that includes asthma, allergic rhinitis, atopic dermatitis, IgE-mediated food allergy, and overt anaphylaxis to foods. Looking at EOE pathophysiology, EOE has been recognized to be a type 2 inflammatory or TH2 mediated condition that's characterized by marked eosinophil infiltration into the esophagus. EOE is activated most commonly by food allergens, uh, typically milk, wheat, soy, or egg, but also environmental aeroallergens have also been implicated in a small subset of patients. These allergic mediators then trigger an inflammatory cascade with key cytokine mediators that include IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13. The downstream effect on the tissue is remodeling of the esophagus, loss of barrier function, and perpetuation of eosinophilic infil infiltration. The current treatment options for eosinophilic esophagitis include the three Ds. The first D being dietary approaches, which in 2021 are dominated by the empiric elimination diets, the second D for dilation, which is an endoscopic approach to dealing with remodeling aspects of disease. And the third D are drugs or pharmacologic therapies, which primarily are focused on proton pump inhibition and swallowed topical corticosteroids. Importantly, currently there are no medications yet approved by the US FDA for the treatment of eosinophilic esophagitis or any eosinophilic GI disease. Let's go on to biologic approaches to treat EOE. Now, why would you consider biologic therapy for eosinophilic esophagitis? The most obvious target for biologic therapy are corticosteroid refractory patients. Also, patients who are intolerant to, uh, to swallow topical corticosteroids due to adverse side effects. There's a conceptual advantage of targeting specific allergic mediators that are involved in the pathogenesis of EOE, an advantage of, <clears throat> uh, of um, using systemic treatment for multiple forms of atopic disease. We've already talked about how EOE patients 
have atopic disease outside of the esophagus, such as asthma, allergic rhinitis, food allergy, and atopic dermatitis. Potential benefits of biologic therapy for addressing esophageal remodeling as well as transmural inflammation, and practical benefits of delivering intermittent rather than daily therapy. Now looking to the recent American Gastroenterological Association, or AGA, combined with Joint Task Force on Allergy Immunology Guidelines for the Management of EOE, published in 2020, additional therapeutic options beyond the use of swallowed topical corticosteroids, dilation, and, and uh, diet therapies were examined. These included the use of monoclonal antibodies directed against, anti, against IgE. In the AGA JTF guideline, biologic therapies targeting IgE were the only therapeutic class that was given a recommendation against its use. Other therapeutic options that were examined in the guideline included monoclonal antibodies directed against IL-5, against IL-13, as well as miscellaneous therapies such as Montelukast, Coleman sodium, immunomodulators, and anti-TNF therapy. However, for these additional therapies, these were all given no recommendation based on what was perceived to be a knowledge gap at the time of the publication of the guideline. Now, since the publication of the AGA JTF guideline, additional phase two studies have been published to support the benefits of biologic therapy for eosinophilic esophagitis. The first I want to review with you is dupilumab, which is the monoclonal antibody directed against the IL-4 receptor alpha. Dupilumab inhibits signaling of both IL-4 and IL-13. It has been approved in the U.S. for the treatment of moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, moderate to severe asthma, and also for chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. Importantly, a phase two double-blind placebo-controlled trial for EOE was completed using dupilumab in 2020. Dupilumab was granted breakthrough therapy designation for EOE by the FDA in September 2020. Based on the success of dupilumab in the phase two clinical trial, a phase three clinical trial has been conducted and part A has been presented at scientific meetings. This data shows the phase three part A data showing that dupilumab reduces dysphagia symptoms and esophageal eosinophilia at week 24. This is part of the Liberty EOE TREAT study that was conducted in adolescents and adults with EOE. In this trial, this treatment was given with dupilumab every week for a period of 24 weeks. The co-primary endpoint for this trial was symptom reduction measured by the DSQ, or Daily Symptom Questionnaire, as well as histologic efficacy measured or determined by achieving less than or equal to six eosinophils per high power field in the esophagus. This Part A Phase three study did meet its co-prime endpoint. As shown on the left-hand side of the slide, we see the absolute change in the DSQ symptom score with significant reduction in symptoms of dysphagia with dupilumab compared to placebo. On the right-hand side of the slide, we see the histologic efficacy with 59.5% of patients treated with dupilumab achieving that threshold of less than or equal to six EOs per high power field compared to only 5% who got placebo. Again, a statistically significant and robust improvement. Other secondary endpoints were measured in this phase three part A study, and these are summarized here, including achieving the histologic threshold of less than 15 EOs per high power field, that is below the diagnostic threshold for EOE. This threshold was achieved in 64% with dupilumab, compared to 7.7% with placebo. Again, statistically significant and robust improvement. An endoscopic improvement was also detected using the validated endoscopic scoring tool called EREFS. Significant improvement in endoscopic features with dupilumab compared to placebo. Another secondary endpoint looked at a more comprehensive assessment of the histologic abnormalities for eosinophilic esophagitis looking beyond the reduction in the peak eosinophil count and looking at ancillary histologic abnormalities that include features such as basal zone hyperplasia and dilation of intercellular spaces, measured by a tool called the EOE-HSS 
developed by Margaret Collins at Cincinnati. Here the EOE HSS measures both the histologic severity, called the grade, as well as histologic extent, called the stage score, in eosinophilic esophagitis. In the Phase three Part A study, dupilumab again demonstrated robust and statistically significant improvement in the grade and stage scores compared to placebo. <clears throat> Another biologic study that was published after the AGH-ATF guideline used a monoclonal antibody directed against IL-13 called sindacumab, formerly known as RPC-4046. This is a recombinant humanized monoclonal IgG kappa antibody that is highly selective for IL-13. It inhibits binding of IL-13 to both the alpha-1 and alpha-2 receptors. In this clinical trial, it was administered as a weekly subcutaneous injection. This phase two clinical trial randomized patients with EOE to one of two doses of sindacumab compared to placebo. The treatment was given weekly for 16 weeks. The primary endpoint of this phase two clinical trial was histologic efficacy, looking at the change in the mean esophageal eosinophil count. As you can see summarized on the left-hand side with placebo, basically no change in the histologic activity, but with both low dose and high dose RPC-4046 or sindacumab, significant and robust histologic improvement. Endoscopic activity was also measured as a secondary endpoint, and here again we see the data for EREFs. With placebo, no change in endoscopic activity, but with both low dose and high dose sindacumab, significant improvement in endoscopic activity. Lerentilimab is a monoclonal antibody directed against cyclic 8. Cyclic 8 is a receptor that's selectively expressed on the surface of mast cells in eosinophils. When a cyclic 8 receptor is engaged with the monoclonal antibody, it causes eosinophil depletion. And when it uh, uh, binds to, the, to cyclic 8 receptor on mast cells, it causes mast cell inhibition. Lerentilimab, the cyclic 8 monoclonal antibody, has been studied in a phase 2 clinical trial in eosinophilic gastritis and duodenitis. This was, in fact, the first double-blind placebo-controlled trial ever conducted in an eosinophilic GI disease below the esophagus. <clears throat> in this uh, clinical trial, histologic and symptom efficacy was demonstrated. The primary endpoint for this phase 2 clinical trial was histologic, looking at the mean change in the esophageal eosinophil count. And as you can see on the left-hand side of the slide, there was statistically significant and quite robust reduction in tissue eosinophilia, whether it was in the stomach or the duodenum. In fact, in the placebo patients, there was a 9% increase in tissue eosinophilia. With the low-dose uh, lirantelumab, 79% reduction in tissue eosinophilia. With the high-dose lirantelumab, a 92% reduction in tissue eosinophilia. <clears throat> Looking on the right-hand side at the symptoms measured by a total symptom score, or TSS, there was a placebo response demonstrated with a 22% reduction in symptoms. However, with lerentilumab, both at low dose and high dose, statistically significant improvements compared to placebo. Now let's turn to the latest insights on biologic approaches to treat both EOE and eosinophilic GI disease with highlights from UEGW and the American College of Gastroenterology meetings from 2021. The first study to look at is the Phase three Part C study for dupilumab. This Part C study looked at the efficacy of dupilumab for maintenance therapy for patients with eosinophilic esophagitis. On the left-hand side of the side, we're seeing the co-primary endpoint of symptom efficacy using the DSQ instrument showing a, a robust and maintained symptom improvement with the DSQ for both patients who were initially were randomized to placebo and continued on dupilumab, as well as for the cohort of patients who got dupilumab, both for induction and for maintenance therapy. On the right-hand side of the slide, we're seeing the co-primary endpoint for histologic efficacy, the proportion of patients who are achieving less than or equal to six eosinophils prior power field, Again, this was achieved for the induction therapy and during maintenance therapy, both groups of patients, the patients who were initially got placebo followed by tepilumab, as well as for the patients who got tepilumab throughout the 52-week treatment period,
continued to show histologic efficacy with response rates of 60% and 55.9% respectively. Going on to <clears throat> uh, secondary endpoints, including histologic endpoints of achieving less than 15 ESNFLs per high power field. Again, for both subgroups of patients, the patients initially randomized to placebo followed by tepilumab, or patients who got tepilumab throughout the 52 weeks. Again, <clears throat> histologic efficacy was demonstrated with over 70% of patients achieving this important threshold. Endoscopic improvement was also maintained throughout the 52 week treatment period. We talked earlier about the EOE HSS, the uh, more comprehensive histologic scoring tool. Again, as, as demonstrated here, throughout the 52-week treatment maintenance period, histologic efficacy demonstrated uh, for both the extent and severity of the histologic findings, both for both groups, uh, randomized to placebo followed by dupilumab or dupilumab, dupilumab throughout the 52-week treatment period. In terms of safety, <clears throat> safety, safety data is summarized here both for uh, week 24 and week 52. In terms of adverse events, these were comparable between the patients who initially got placebo as well as for the patients randomized to dupilumab. Injection site reactions were more commonly seen in patients who got dupilumab as would be expected for a biologic therapy. In addition, from the meetings, uh, we saw phase two open label data to support the efficacy for lerentelumab, which showed sustained and uh, sustained reductions in the eosinophilic counts in an open label extension for patients with eosinophilic gastritis and duodenitis. Here we're seeing the proportion of patients meeting histologic remission criteria, which for the stomach were achieving less than or equal to four eosinophils prior power field and for the duodenum, achieving less than or equal to 15 ESNFLs per power field. These thresholds were met with 100% 100 of patients at day 659 for treatment during open label extension with lerentelumab. In terms of symptom efficacy for lerentelumab, here we're seeing the sustained symptom benefit measured by the total symptom score or TSS score in patients who continue to receive lerentelumab in open label extension. Uh, throughout the 96-week uh, follow-up period. In terms of the safety data for lerentelumab, lerentelumab was generally well tolerated. The most common adverse uh, uh, event was mild to moderate infusion-related reactions. Mostly these occurred on the first infusion and were greatly, greatly reduced or did not occur in subsequent infusions. There were no drug-related SAEs in the open-label extension. Other ongoing studies for the treatment of eosinophilic esophagitis and eosinophilic GI disease are underway. This includes a phase through three study for sindacumab, the monoclonal antibody directed against IL-13. This is being studied in adults with eosinophilic esophagitis. A phase two clinical trial for mepolizumab, the monoclonal antibody directed against IL-5, being studied in a phase two trial in adults with EOE. Benralizumab, which is a monoclonal antibody directed against the IL-5 receptor. This is being studied in a phase two and three trial in eosinophilic gastritis and duodenitis, as well as a phase three clinical trial for eosinophilic esophagitis. Dupilumab is being studied in a phase three trial for EOE in pediatrics, as well as a phase two clinical trial in eosinophilic gastritis. Finally, there's a trosimod, which is an S1P receptor modulator, now being studied in a phase two clinical trial for eosinophilic esophagitis. So to conclude, multiple new treatment options are being developed for eosinophilic esophagitis. These include biologics that are targeting allergic pathways in eosinophilic esophagitis, and they've demonstrated clinical efficacy in phase two and phase three clinical trials. EOE patients have an elevated risk for atopic and other immune-mediated diseases, which should be considered when, considered when evaluating treatment options. Finally, future management that incorporates a personalized and precision medical approach to eosinophilic GI diseases are on the horizon. Thank you for your attention. This activity is certified by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated. This activity is developed with our educational partner, PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening. 
download materials, and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash AZH860. This activity is supported by an independent medical education grant from Regeneron Pharmaceuticals Incorporated and Sanofi Genzyme.